let's jump in and uh, kind of do a brief recap. So yesterday we discussed kind of extensively all the directions were pulled, right? And we can relate to this on so many levels at so many stages in life and how we define ourselves and how many hats we wear and how much pressure we're under, um, maybe feelings of inadequacy, feelings of, you know, struggling to measure up, to speed, I, I, et cetera. So I think that for a lot of us, we have many demands and we have to check in with ourselves and say, how am I showing up in those areas? And yesterday we talked about some really powerful skills that can help us kind of be more self-aware while not, um, you know, like, well, not beating ourselves up. And it's this delicate balance between like a growth mindset and wanting to move forward and wanting to be healthy. But on the other hand, acknowledging the everyday struggles of life. And we start off by really saying like, if you are struggling, thank God you're alive and you're part of the human race and you're doing, you're doing well uh, because you're here and that it's really part of this, the human story. It's part of our story. And we discuss specifically as women, what that means to us. Um, and we kind of tried to look at some of the tools we have so far. And so far, I think some of the tools we discussed were acknowledging that, first of all, there is that struggle and trying to name it and understand where it's coming from and understand that we're hardwired that way. We're built that way with this internal pull. Um, and I think the definition we, we really gave was, you know, the godly soul, the animal soul, kind of both like wanting full control of what we say and what we do and what we actively think. So with that, we started off with that. And then we said, well, we do have we do have, we do have some power, you know, one tool that's really awesome. And that's the ability to control that our mind can in fact control our emotions, even though that is deep, deep work and way easier said than done, but it's, we need to know what's available to us, right? Like there are a lot of skills that are challenging, but we do know it's something in our, let's say in our arsenal against the challenges and struggles we have, we have this incredible tool. And then we moved on and we discussed, and I don't want to spend too much time on a massive recap, but I feel like if someone's here, um, in one class, it's, it's helpful to have a little bit of a context. And then we went on to discuss like when we, like when we feel that we have that mind over matter, but then we, the mind over emotions. And then we discussed like, there's the long way and the short way of how to approach things. And we said there's one is based on like this, you know, adrenaline that we have um, to, to like for of an, an, another emotion that's there that we can tap into. And the other one takes deep hard work. So think of like something that you've changed in life. Like, let's say you've, you've had to cram for something, anything, I don't know. In-laws are coming over, a holiday's coming and the chaos, the cramming. Okay. You're so motivated by an external factor of making the holiday beautiful, or, you know, being a loving, wonderful host that you'll find the skill set to navigate it. It may cause chaos, but you can The long, that's a short shortcut, short solutions. Okay. Like I'm going to find that adrenaline, you know, like I said, there's nothing there's nothing like the five minute cleanup before someone like says, Hey, I'm coming over in five minutes. And like the house suddenly is like, you, you can't even, you can't even clean up that quickly ever. That's an external adrenaline, like an external motivator. Whereas like, Oh, we all, right. We all thought during quarantine, we we're going to organize every closet, every drawer, every house, every everything. And I don't know how many drawers of closets you got through. I had very big objectives, but it didn't happen. And now if I took a course on organization and, and, and what it does to me emotionally and neurologically, I would be able to do it because that would be a long process where I have a, you know, a coach and I'm working on it. And both of those abilities to change and to transform ourselves are, you know, like both of those styles or modes are excellent because they, they do affect change. And we need to have both of them in our, um, we need to have both of them in our arsenal. We can't just wait until we like, really can re -see, th see things differently. And then we'll be able to change. Like, okay, once I understand the importance of being a calm, pleasant wife or mother, then I'll get there. Like I'll take a course, I'll hire a coach. No, 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 like today, supper needs to be served. I need to be, you know, patient, present, calm, whatever. So both are in essential, okay? And that's where kind of we went off, um, we like discussed extensively and we ended off with, also, how are we showing up when life is beyond our control? And I think this is like the perfect segue into today. And I think that ultimately the Tanya, the book of the Tanya, which we're discussing, which gives us incredible skills as women, as sisters, as daughters, as friends, as however, again, all employees, whatever, however you're, you know, showing up at whatever your life looks like, right? Um, I think we're moving on to understanding something that's, we're, we're moving it up a notch. We're, we're going further. We're trying to understand this deeper because we, we ended off with saying, okay, like 
life is going to throw things at us. There's undoubtedly challenges that are going to come our way, issues that are going to make things difficult, things that are not going to be pleasant, right? And like, now what skills do I have? I can't always remember that my mind could control my emotions. What, where, where do I make space for my emotions? Does that mean suppressing my emotions? What about my talents? What about my character traits that are a little less than, um, you know, they're not, they're not shining beautifully in my life. What do I do about that? And what do I do about real challenges that come my way that, you know, really throw me for a loop? I don't know. I think the whole world understands what that means right now, right? We all can understand what it means when life throws things at us. Like, so there's some big, big philosophical concepts in the book of Tanya that discuss that really, and this is really beyond the scope of this. I, I feel like we can't not mention it. And I'm sure there are so many other like forums and platforms to have a class on this. It's a whole class on its own. But like, is there something as a bad thing in my life, right? When you look at a child struggling and challenging and, and, and they're challenged and they're, they're having a hard time or we're having a hard time, we know there's, there's two ways to look at it. Oh, well, this is my challenge and I'm stuck in the world in a pandemic and whatever. I immobilize, I can't move forward. And then there's also, okay, this is a growth opportunity, right? And we know that if we can see things as a growth opportunity, then we can actually grow from it. Okay, that we could take something that's a real struggle. And I'm not speaking necessarily for myself, but I could sometimes, you look at these people who have, you know, these inspirational speakers who, you know, were born without limbs and they're, they're, they're you know, or people have really hard lives and they're getting up there and they're inspiring others and they're learning and they're growing. Like there are definitely, we can look in the world and see people who really do struggle. And yet what they do with that struggle is tremendous. They bring so light into the world. And so we do believe fundamentally that what happens to us is good. There's revealed good. There's concealed good. And we always ask for revealed good. Like we're like Hashem, God, please give us good in my language, right? Like I understand it's coming from higher worlds and it's trickling down into this world and it's manifestation and it's a growth opportunity. Like, again, like I said, none of us would have ordered this pandemic, but is there good from here? Can there be good? Can we grow from this? Can our family, can our home, can our communities, so much goodness and kindness comes sometimes from the deepest challenges and struggles. I'll say right now, Texas has to re-examine its energy source and, and, and how it's handling the grid that can, you know, supply everybody. I don't think if they had, didn't have this week or this challenge, would they look at it? Would they say, oh, this is a really good time to upgrade. And, you know, like it's only sometimes when things don't work that we're able to see like, okay, there's an area to improve. And I think that we, that, so again, we could go down the rabbit hole why bad things happen. We're not going to today, not because it's not a fascinating subject and a wonderful philosophical, uh, you know, puzzle or maze, but it's because it's going to take away from the other things we're going to accomplish. But I'm sure we can circle back to that in another class because um, it's a good one, obviously. But what, 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 what the darkness or the pain or the challenge that we have, we're meant to transform and bring light into them. And we're meant to do so with joy. And here's where we kind of get into a new section in the Tanya where the altar is starting to discuss why is it so significant to have joy in our lives? You know, what's interesting. The early Chabad Hasidim were called the Freilacher, the happy ones. Like, what was it? Poverty. I don't know. Like, what, what were they living through? Pogroms, poverty, Siberia. Like, what, what, what was going on? I mean, like, they weren't exactly like living, you know, in a penthouse in Manhattan with Butler service, right? So how are they known as the happy ones? And so here that's where it like enters the like next section of time to discuss the significance, importance, and necessity of joy. And what's interesting is if you look at society now, we're obsessed with happiness, right? We're obsessed. What makes you happy? Are you happy? How do you think, right? We're like, we, we almost, I, I'm gonna say this and maybe it sounds wrong, but we almost idolize happiness as this like obscure goal that everyone needs and everyone wants and, and they're happy, but I'm not happy. And what makes me happy? What you made me unhappy, right? Like it's like this thing, like go you know, Google podcasts on how to become happy, right? Like it's, it's, it's this product that we're, you know, pursuit of happiness. And yet we're pretty miserable. <laughs> I'm not saying all of you, but we're struggling with happiness. It's, we're on the struggle bus when it comes to this. So how do we equate this? And here the altar is saying, no, no, happiness is an essential ingredient. Why is it an essential ingredient? And how do we get there? And I think that what's interesting is at the, the altar even says a quote, like in the Tanya, you can be able to serve Hashem with like a gladness of heart, with no trace of sadness. And I remember when I learned that when I was younger, I was like, that is not possible. Like, is that ever even like, is that possible? 
right? Because we could really get down and we could say like, we have emotional blockages. We have life events that throw us curveballs. We have moments that really we feel immobilized. We can't move. We, we can't um, function, right? But as we kind of ended towards yesterday, if we shift our perspective and say, hey, there's Manya, there's a soul that's in my body, but that's here for a reason. There's something that I'm supposed to do. And then I know I'm here and I'm doing that. I'm here for a reason. There's something I need. The world needs of me. Like, how can I understand this? And the analogy the altar gives is two wrestlers. That if they're two wrestlers wrestling, okay, who's going to succeed? The wrestler that gets the second one wrestler gets a little tired, lethargic, ex- like drained. The other wrestler has the upper hand. And Alterbert discusses here is where, when we feel down, when we feel depressed, when we feel stuck. And I'm not, I want to make a disclaimer that we're not talking about clinical depression, it needs medication, it needs, you know, absolute support and help to get out of. And I would say that Tanya is not a replacement, you know, for therapy, but it's certainly with cognitive, behavior, cognitive behavioral therapy. Tanya is incredible because like I said, last class, it gives us an inner, inner look. And then we, we get to go beyond that. Right. Um, but the advantage of happiness, we know try a day, right. You know, look at one of the days in the past month that you've had one day you wake up and you're just not feeling it. You're sad. You're down. You're overwhelmed. You're worried. You're anxious. You're... How easy is it for you to tackle your tasks? We're not even talking about the extended to-do list. I'm talking about like, get up, you know, maybe talk to Hashem and Davin, get dressed, maybe exercise, uh, feed people that you love or yourself, which, you know, just, we're talking about basics, get a load of laundry. And we're taught, go to work. How easy is it to do? It's really hard when you're feeling blah, blah, negative, miserable. It's, it's really hard. And not only is it hard, I'm sure we all have had that experience where it's hard to be around someone who's, that's the energy they're emitting and sharing with the world. You know, I always like, I remember once one of my kids, like I was in a bad mood and one of my kids, I was like cranky or something. And I said, well, like, I'm not allowed to be in a bad mood. She's like, but you're a mommy. When a mommy's in a bad mood, that's like the whole family feels it. it and it's, it, so this, where is this advantage to happiness and what do we do about it? Cause we certainly, I think can relate to the idea that we can, you know, conquer and, ch- you know, challenges, like when we're in the right mind frame, you ever had a situation where one day something was like, nothing was right and no one was right and everyone was wrong. And, and then the next situa- day, like everything was fine and like, no one changed, right? Your husband didn't have a lobotomy or your boss didn't become a, f- a nicer person. Like us, what we feel, what's in our mind and our happiness. Okay. It's dictating a lot. And the author goes on to explain what do we do when we aren't really frustrated or dissatisfied with where we're at, a failing, a shortcoming. And the analogy that author gives like, what if you're in the middle of davening or learning Torah? You're doing something that's holy. Your godly soul is rocking and shining and suddenly in comes a negative thought. And it marches and, it dom- and it's taking up space. It's taking up energy. And not only that, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm in the middle of prayer. I'm in the middle of learning Torah, why am I having this thought now? Stop, pause. First of all, it's actually a really good sign because it means your godly soul was in active control and in active mode and your animal soul was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh-uh, I am so uncomfortable with this holiness. I am so uncomfortable with this person maximizing their potential spiritually. I am so uncomfortable with them connecting and in alignment with who they are and why they're here. Let me see if I can plant some sort of seed or some sort of idea that's negative. Maybe I could plant something. Ooh, even better. If I can get this person to go down that rabbit hole, guess what? Prayer is on the back burner. Even if they're mumbling the words, it's on the back burner. It's secondary. So when we're in the middle of something holy and we're in the middle of something spiritual or in the middle of something, and I want to say holiness and spirituality as women is not necessarily sitting in prayer or learning Torah. Yes, those are holy. Those are spiritual. I am not blasphemous. I'm not going to say not. But creating a warm, nurturing home, being there for a friend, being kind. There's so many ways that holiness happens or we're connected in a holy, godly way with our entire essence, 
our mood, our personality, our energy, everything, right? And so when it's at those moments where we are shining and we say, oh, there's that self-doubt that's going to creep in, okay? Oh, you think you can volunteer this way? You're not enough. You think you have the ability to reach out to a fellow Jewish neighbor and you're not the rabbi, you're not the rabbitson. Like all that, when you are engaging in something that's bringing light into the world and you have that negative voice, thought, idea that's creeping in, here's what the Altarba suggests. And I think it's such a game changer. Pause, don't ignore the emotion whether it's self-doubt, whether it's you're, you're embarrassed, whether it's imposter syndrome showing up in your life, right? You're not enough. You can't. Negative, a negative narrative. Or it's downright. I'm praying to Hashem, it's Rosh Hashanah. And now I'm thinking about, oh my gosh, the laundry and the food and the dishes and the to-do list. And I'm like, oh gosh, it's the holiest day of the year. What am I doing? So that's an easy remedy because you just kind of realign. But when it's something that's negative, that needs to be dealt with. This area of my life isn't working. This is a negative character trait that I'm struggling with. This is something like, you know, that cheeseburger sounds really good, <laughs> right? I don't know, something that's in our head. What we need to do is say, okay, I hear you. I see you. You're showing up at the wrong meeting at the wrong time. Let's make a meeting to deal with you tomorrow. And this is where we call mindfulness. We call it sacred time or sacred space. In Judaism, we have during the evening, you know, pre-bedtime prayer, the Shema prayer, there's a lot of time for self-reflection, self-assessment. Where am I holding? Where can I improve? Where are my shortcomings? Where are areas that I can grow? But when I'm in the middle of doing good, when I'm in the middle of doing something holy, when I'm in the middle of doing something significant, mm -mm, you don't belong here. So it doesn't mean we suppress it and it doesn't mean we ignore it but we put it where it belongs. We say, I'll see you tomorrow. Let's make an appointment. Two o'clock, two o'clock. You know what happens? The negative thoughts and negative character traits don't show up for the meeting at two o'clock because their whole function wasn't to be solved. Their function was to throw you off your, <laughs> off your game while you were doing something holy because there's this constant battle, balance between negative and positive energy in this world that's within us. And you and I are active players in tackling that. You and I are active in saying, no, 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 no. Right now I'm present with my children. I'm spending time reading to them, playing puzzles, sitting by the fireplace. The negative thoughts that I'm not, you know, I'm inadequate at, or I'm not a dealing this, this doesn't belong now. So the altar says, you know how you know if it's showing up at the wrong time? Did it show up when you were in the middle of a really good business deal? No? Oh, that's because... <laughs> you, did it show up when you were shopping in the mall or online shopping? No, it shows up when you're doing something holy. So pay attention when you're doing something holy, when, you're anim when your godly soul is steering the ship and see what are those negative thoughts that pop in. And that's how you know, yeah, I'll deal with them. Not now, not here. You don't belong. I'm being focused, I'm present. I need to be in touch with what I'm actually doing now. So that inner fragmentation, the inner voices of inadequacy, there's time and space to deal with them. But when? Certainly not all day. Certainly not if it's keeping me in my bed and not able to tackle the things that I'm here for. Because the truth is when someone's really down and someone's really like miserable, you know what happens? They can't shine their light. But every one of us, the world needs us. The world needs our light, our talents, our skills, our abilities, who we are. The world needs us. There's no replacement, right? There's no someone else who's going to step in and be me. The world, right? If our fingerprints are, at, are unique, certainly our souls and our purpose and the areas in life that we're supposed to bring light to. So let's see when that negative thought pops in. And algebra deals with this in a very unique way as well when it comes to feelings of guilt and feelings of shame. Feelings of sadness, I'm not measuring up, I feel a little bit sad, I can't accomplish what I need to. Or feelings of bitterness, what's the difference? What's the difference? When I feel bad about something, okay, I know I could do better. I know I could do better. Do I feel like I'm such a loser? 
what's wrong with me? Why can't I do it? Everyone else could figure it out. I'm the only one who can't. Where do I feel like, okay, this is something it's not working and I need to work on it. One leads to positive action. One leads to me shifting, changing, evolving, growing. One keeps me in that negative, non-productive space, covering up that light within. And that's how you know. Ask yourself, if I go down this rabbit hole, will I stay down the rabbit hole? <laughs> will I be able to say, okay, this is something I'm struggling with and this is something I need to address and improve. If, it, the, if the outcome is productive, great. But if I just feel ashamed, think to yourself, the teacher that inspired you, motivated you, helped you grow, it was never out of shame. Never out of shame. It's a non-productive emotion. No one's going to shame you into changing your behavior or improving. Inspiring you, saying, I know you're better than that. I know you could do it. I know you can. So what are we telling ourselves? Because we have an inner dialogue. Am I getting stuck in that guilt and shame cycle? I'm so, I feel so guilty that I did it. I'm so, in, uh, so ashamed. Or am I, okay, I acknowledge that this is an area I can improve, carve out time, carve out space, come up with a plan. And here's where I want to say again, the value of a mentor, someone you can turn to and say, look, this is an area in my life. I'm, I know I'm not measuring up in. What can I do about it? Because sometimes, in a, and that's sometimes, very often an objective opinion is really, really powerful tool, okay? So highly recommend that. You know, you would never think that someone in the music industry or a sports industry shouldn't have a coach or shouldn't have someone that they turn to to strengthen their skill set, to become better, to improve. Of course, who's their teacher? Who's their voice trainer, right? Who's their tennis or gymnastics trainer? You don't get to the Olympics just, you know, doing it on your own. I think that for ourselves also, when we struggle with different areas of life, who am I turning to? Who can I gain strength from? Now, yes, we have this incredible platform of sisterhood, Beishana, friends, learning, constantly learning again and again. And the more we feed and nourish, the more we can grow ourselves, the more we can grow. But sometimes we need a little bit of a customized specialty, right? We need to talk to someone specifically. So I really, really want to kind of push that, you know, drive that point home a, a little bit more, how significant and important it is to have some sort of mentor that we can turn to. And we know we could feel bad, you know, feel bad about what we did. Like, I know, okay, I'm going to say something that's a little blasphemous. Jewish guilt, <laughs> Jewish guilt is so popular. Like we all know it, we see it, we do it, we hear it, we've, there's jokes about it. There's probably whole comedic routines about Jewish guilt. But serving Hashem through guilt, I don't know. You know, I think to, I think to my students, I always say to them, I say, I had a student, it was once, um, I'm two years in a row, didn't come to a single event, showed up at Yom Kippur. And once I said to her, you know, I, I, right after at Yom Kippur, I got her, I said, hey, we're going to go for coffee. Yeah, let's meet up for coffee. We met up for coffee on campus. I said, you know, it's so nice to see you connecting Jewishly, like, but Yom Kippur, like, that's the worst day, like, of all days you choose to be connected, why Yom Kippur? Like, we're not feeding you. <laughs> Prayers you don't understand. What's going on? And she said, you know, I really want to do well. I really don't want to fail this semester. And if I don't show up on Yom Kippur, I'm worried what will happen. I said, you know what? I want you to show up on some Chat Torah. I want you to show up on Purim. Judaism has all ways to show up. Being a Jew, being a mother, being a friend, being a sister, just out of guilt. Do you ever had someone who just did something for you just because they felt guilty? No, that doesn't feel good. Even if we have obligations that we do just because we, can you imagine if I just felt my family, fed my family because I feel guilty? Cereal milk it would be, right? Which I'm not against cereal milk for dinner. I'm just going to put that out there. Sometimes cereal milk is the best dinner. So we're going to go with that. <laughs> but I think like we can't operate. Guilt can't be steering our, our um, can't be the motivation behind the way we show, do it, like do everything else we need to as women, right? Fine. I'll do the favor for a person. Fine. I'll bring, you know, go to the homeless shelter. 
I feel so guilty. So, okay, now I'll give my kids an hour of my time. Again, not going to work. But guilt cannot be the, the emotion that motivates it. And certainly not in our relationship with God, with our souls, with our Judaism. We got to realize that there's a there's full human being, full emotions, and really God wants a relationship with all parts of us. Even our struggles, even our personality traits, we're a little less than proud of. So sometimes a person's like, okay, I'm a little stubborn or I'm a little hot-headed. Let's say someone's hot-headed. They can spend so many years trying to suppress, ignore, disconnect from their hot-headedness. So much time and energy berating themselves over the fact that they have a hot-headed quality. Or they can say, wait, God made me. And even in this area, I could serve Hashem. Even in this area, I can look. Remember, we said everything is created with balance. So if my hot-headedness is showing up in my life in an unpleasant way, can I use that as fuel? to be extra compassionate, extra caring, extra loving, extra dedicated, extra anything, right? So I think when we sometimes look at ourselves and we try to fight the character trait of how we're hardwired, instead of saying one second, God did not create anything. There's nothing in this world that's here for no reason, including my negative character trait. I could serve Hashem, with this negative character trait. So can you imagine, take a moment, think of something that you've spent way too long beating yourself up over. Peer it away to its most neutral space. Can you channel it in a different direction? And I'll give you an example. I have one child, thank God I have six, and I had one who had, uh, you know, in PTA when the teacher says this one has a lot of extra energy, you know what that means, right? Right, we all know what that means. Okay, so if you've ever had that, I didn't even have PTA, and this is the kind of PTAs we would have. We were, we're homeschooled, there's no schools, but I was the teacher and the principal, so I got to give the PTA to myself. A lot of, a lot of fascinating, and the director also. Okay, and I had a child who didn't understand how to channel the energy they had. And the natural answer for, and I'm, again, I'm not, um, this is not a political statement here, but the natural answer was, well, we should medicate this child. We were told by people, medicate this child. And my husband and I said, he was born this way. We are going to give him the skills, the ability to learn how to self-regulate, learn how to use this powerful engine that he has within him to go further. Our little airport here has it's two gates. The person who takes your ticket takes your luggage. The last time I was there, they asked me, I was there alone. They said, TSA they said, oh, no kids today. And I'm like, I don't know you. This is creepy. Why are you asking me this? Like, like I, you shouldn't be like knowing how, why I'm traveling alone. Like, this is weird, right? But it's okay. It's a cute place and it's College Station and we love it. But the planes are small. And I remember the first time I got on one, thank God these are not the propeller planes anymore. The store just said, you move to this side, you move to that side. And I said, excuse me, what are you doing? She said, oh, we uh, balancing the weight. I said, can I get off? She's like, what? She was so confused. I said, if my burger is going to bring this plane down, I'm out. Like, get me out of here. I was so, ah, but okay. Now we have planes that aren't propellers and uh, now they're engines. But the reason they can only get me from College Station to Dallas or College Station to Houston. And that's because they don't have strong enough engines. They're small. They don't have enough power. They can't have enough gas. I had to look at this child and say, Hashem gave this child extra power, extra fuel, extra gas. And sometimes it manifested itself in stubbornness and difficulty. And sometimes what it manifests itself as, can I help this child learn how to use that power to accomplish amazing things? And I remember having one such conversation with this child explaining to them in a very loving way that when you learn how to use the power Hashem gave you, you're going to accomplish incredible things with it. The caveat was when. <laughs> and the job of the parents was we had to help this child get there. 
And I look at this child now, a fine young man who is so driven and hardworking and capable and pleasant. And people do not believe we could just have a fun conversation. I could tell tales, you know, you know, the kid that was swinging from, you know, whatever the roof that's, but I look at this child. He doesn't even remember half the stories, but I remember that point. And I said, don't fight us as parents. Cause we're trying to help you learn how to use the talents and the gifts you have. So you can accomplish insane stuff in this world. Hashem, Cause he was struggling with what he had inside. He didn't know how to make sense of it. And I said, it's okay. It's you're a little person with a lot of energy, but you're going to grow. And as you grow, you're going to learn how to use that energy, that determination, that driven personality for good. And when you do, whew, watch out world, you're going to accomplish amazing things. Now, here's the question. Can I do that for myself? Can I look inward? Can I say to myself, this is a quality I have, and I've been carrying this quality for a long time. How could I turn it, bring it to its most neutral space and maybe once this week channel it in a different way. How about this? Maybe even once this week, I could see it differently. Because if I could do it for myself, then I could start doing it for others too. So it's actually easier, I think, to do for others than for ourselves, but we also count. We're also a godly soul here for a reason. We also need to bring light into the world. So how much energy am I spending beating myself up for the character traits I have? And how much energy can I channel and saying, what can I do with that? How can I make that different in life? And these are really, really powerful questions, ideas that we need to ask ourselves. Because then we stop dragging. Remember we talked about yesterday, the bird's wings. We stop dragging those wings on our side. They're not burdens. They're fuel. They help us soar. They help us be us. And I think that if we could do that for ourselves, we could do it for our sisters, we could do it for our friends, we could do it for our daughters, we could do it for all those in our lives. Help them see that and help them channel it in a really powerful and positive way. Um, moving on though, because I know there's so much here and I know there's so much that we could still discuss. Each of these, I have to say, this is typical style. Each of these could be unpacked and have their own, like we could sit around with coffee and discuss one of these concepts. So we're putting a lot of different tools out there and hopefully one of these will resonate with you. And you'll say, you know what? That's something I can pick up and I can see how I can use in my life. But they're all Torah's wisdom. They're all based on Kabbalah that's a, that we are able to apply to our day-to-day -day struggle. Because I think, I think often we think again of holiness as like, okay, when I go to the synagogue, when I eat, you know, choose that kosher piece of meat. And that's holy. Those are holy moments. But holy moments are also when I'm about to, I don't know, not be my best self. Can I rein it in? When I have a negative, you know, story going on, what can I do about it? But if we see that we're in this world for a reason and everything that makes me me can be elevated for good even and can be really a conduit for godliness and light. That's big. And that may mean I have talents I haven't explored. That may mean I have gifts that God has given me that I've shied away from because I feel maybe, I don't know, insecure, imposter syndrome. I'm not sure I could do that. Someone else is for sure better at that than me. But if God gave it to you, he gave it to you to bring light into the world. See, we think bringing light into the world is, you know, lighting a Shabbos candle. It is. Lighting a Shabbos candle is tikkun olam. Picking a kosher piece of meat, we're repairing the world. We're revealing the godliness within the matter that exists. This cup can be holy, is holy. I have a kosher tea in it. I'm using it to take care of my throat, my body, as I'm teaching and learning Torah together with you lovely ladies. This is holy. I make a blessing on it. Judaism says everything has potential for holiness. You and I are active players. How we engage in the world and in matter, we can elevate and bring godly. But tikkun olam, repairing the world and holiness is also inside. It's my character traits. It's my mindset. It's talents that I'm leaving on the side because when I get around to it or when I think or, or, or 
maybe I'm telling my, you know, a lot of negative self-talk and I'm not letting myself shine in that area. That also has a potential for holiness because holiness is where God and this world are one. But the absence of holiness, Kalipa, negative energy, is it that there is, there's this is a cup. It happens to be a cup. It happens to be made out of clay. It's nothing to do with God. What does God have to say about my glass, my tea? Should I make a blessing? Should it be called? What does God have to say about it? No, your talents are the external world and materialism are all one with God. And the inner world can be one with God. And you and I are active players in what we do about that. Think of something maybe you're obsessed with. I'm obsessed with fashion and you berate yourself over it. I'm not obsessed with fashion, but let's say I was. I could say, oh, how superficial am I? Or I could say, wow, I have an eye for fashion. It's, it's not a mistake. I was created like this for a reason. What can I do about this? How can I use this to bring light into the world? So let's start looking at our character traits, the world around us. Maybe things we're obsessed with. Maybe talents that are latent, hidden, concealed, for not letting them shine. Zoom into it and say, how can I bring light into the world with this? Because if you've met it, there's a reason you've met it. If it's a part of your life, there's a reason it's a part of your life. So here's where there is this novel. And we're gonna just, I'm gonna try to get back to where we were, but either way, we'll, we'll I'm sure we'll end up you know, back there in a, in a good way and somehow. Um, so here's where we have um, to kind of like, let's, let me, you know, let me recap for a few steps because then it will take me back and then we'll get back to where we need to be, right? Okay, here's where we started off with the necessity for joy and optimism. Like, why is it so significant and important to stay, be happy? Because when, when we feel inner contentment, we can, we can accomplish. Now, it doesn't mean we don't accomplish till we get there. And here's where I think, um, because we said, you know, like we said, life is going to throw challenges our way. Life is going to throw issues our way. And, and it's not going to be easy to, you know, maintain positivity or what happens when things don't seem to be good. And, and then we kind of talked about, you know, guilt and shame and how we handle those in our life and the toxicity of them and how they really block us from like accomplishing what we need to and maximizing our potential. Um, and we talked about the futility of shame, right? Like it's not like, unless, unless it's going to motivate me to become a better person and shame is not the best ingredient to do so. Um, and then we said that, and here's something that I feel like I may have touched upon, but I probably didn't expand. And I think we need to expand it. In one of the concepts that Alter Abbey describes, that let's say I'm struggling with a mitzvah. Let's say there's a mitzvah that's difficult for me. Hold on, let me just shut my, cause it's gonna constantly, hold on. The link is in WhatsApp. Give me a, I'm sorry, all this tech error. This is, uh, I now understand all my, the students, the professors are all struggling with the technology. So it's making me a little more compassionate to understand. Uh, technology, you know, we rely on it and then we rely on it and it's a problem. Um, okay. So here's where it's something that's so significant to really keep in mind that often we see in a mitzvah that I'm struggling with. Okay. Let's say I know I want to light Shabbat candles weekly, or I know I want to really carve out the money and the uh, coordinate, you know, bringing kosher meat into my home. Okay. Or let's say I know I want to learn more Torah, right? I, I have things that I want to, a mitzvah that I want to do but I'm struggling it because I just passed red lobster and that red lo that lobster looks delicious. And I really, uh, I don't know, should I make a right turn into this? Should I not? I'm struggling. And then I think to myself, what kind of loser are you? You, why are you struggling with this? You know the right thing to do. And this can be with a mitzvah we're trying to do. It can be even with other things we're struggling within who we are as people, within how we want to, what we want to accomplish. I know I want to exercise. What kind of loser? I can't get up. I can't do it. I can't figure it out. I can't, everyone else can. When we're struggling with something, there's ways to look at the struggle. So first we said that we can serve Hashem in that struggle. The author writes something that's so powerful and so beautiful that I think really there's so many concepts in Chabad Hasidus, Chabad philosophy is that we're talking about that really, really shifts how we see life, how we see the world, even as we described earlier, how we see happiness, how we see materialism. Massive, 
paradigm shifts, different lenses to look at life through. How we see guilt, how we see spirituality, how we see a mitzvah we're struggling with. And in this, the altar describes that when you're struggling, acknowledge the fact that you're serving Hashem in the struggle. And the altar says that there's a mitzvah called Lo Sasur Achare Levavchem Viachre don't just go after what your heart wants, your emotions, right? Don't just go after what your eyes see and, oh, I see that. I really want that, right? Or my emotions, how I feel. I really just, I need to go with that. When I'm really in that struggle, I could fight that struggle. Or I could say, in this struggle, I am, there's space to shine. There's space to serve Hashem. If I didn't have that struggle, I wouldn't be serving Hashem in this way. And I think it def- re- can really redefine how we look at our own struggles and those around us who are struggling. Do I berate someone because they're struggling with something or do I recognize that here they could shine and allow that godly light to manifest itself? It could be a condo for holiness. And I kind of think towards the end where before I got cut off, we're talking about holiness, right? And how we often think of holiness as, you know, Yom Kippur in a synagogue and they're all there. Yes, of course, holy. But holiness is in the day-to-day grind. Holiness is in the day-to-day struggle too. Because there's no space that's devoid of God. And you and I get to let God in, right? You and I get to let God shine through us. With our character traits, with our struggles, with our personality, with our failures. You know, it's like, how do we look at failure? You know, I I will never forget one of my sons. He's 21 and his kindergarten teacher had a sign on the door. I don't remember a lot about his kindergarten years, but his kindergarten teacher had a sign that said, have you failed today? If not, why not? And I remember, I mean, I still still hold on to it because that line really, really was like, how do we see failure? Well, the altar of Antonia says, no, no, no. The struggle, and sometimes I'm going to succeed and sometimes it's going to be really hard for me to succeed, but I'm serving Hashem. Remember, Hashem created me with those character traits, with that desire for that lobster, with that. He knows me. He made me. I have a part of him in me. So I can, at any given moment, be a conduit for holiness and light. Like we said, within our character traits, within our talents and abilities, within mitzvot that we can do, within the how we engage matter in this world, how I see materialism in this world. How do I say things that I'm like, so into, I'm so into baking. Well, that's a silly part of me. That's not really important. No, I, you, you can feed a lot of people with, with food. Oh, I, I'm so into money. Great, how can I use my money to do good? How much tzedakah can I give? And even to the extent that the altar outlines that when we give tzedakah, when a person gives tzedakah, you think, okay, so, okay, I have $100 and I'm gonna give 10%, maybe 20%. And that's going to be holy. The altar says, no, 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 all of it's holy. And not only is all of it holy, but all the energy you invested in acquiring that $100, all the matter, you went to work, you drove in a car, the car, the gas, the stress of the commute, the energy to find, I don't know, you're living, you're in Manhattan, you're working in Manhattan, the energy to find the parking spot, walking up the steps, the work that you're doing. All of that has potential to be elevated to holiness. And you and I are active players in that. And that is a really powerful way of looking at the world around us. Again, that requires a shift. How do I look at myself? How do I look at the world? How do I look at materialism? How do I look at my energy that I'm investing in different locations? And at every given moment, Kedusha, holiness, a oneness between God and this world and matter, I have the opportunity to allow it to shine. And this is very different than many perspectives. Serving Hashem in the struggle, serving Hashem with my money, serving Hashem with my energy I use to get that money. All uplifted, all a reflection of godliness. All really making God comfortable in this world because Hashem, God is in this world in a concealed manner and in a very, very intentional design that way. It's designed that way. 
And that's to make space for you and I. So you and I could exist. God made space for the atheist and the agnostic. Wants us to choose, opt in, be involved, be part of it, create space. It's like if I'm having a guest coming over. If I'm having a guest come over, then what do I need to do? I need to make sure they feel comfortable. I want to make sure they feel comfortable in my home. We believe, Judaism believes, that this world, this world is God's home. God desired a home. He wants to feel very comfortable in this world. And so everything we do and everything we touch and every battle we wage internally or to accomplish and tackle the issues or struggles we have, we can serve Hashem. We can make God comfortable. There's no separation. It's not like God's, okay, so God is in the synagogue, but he's not, you know, it, it, in the gym. I tell the students, I don't know if they love hearing this. I say, just remember when you're hanging out our, our little bar strip area is, is called Northgate. I said, remember God's there too. Hey, Manya, don't tell me that. <laughs> God is everywhere. So you're going to say a l'chaim at the bar? Say it on a kosher drink and make a bracha. <laughs> don't just go for a night of clubbing. No, no. God is with you everywhere, right? And I think that intrinsically, if we see ourselves as vehicles, conduits, partners with Hashem, we see our role in life and in the world differently. So think of the mundane activities. Think of the last mitzvah you did. Think of all the materialism that was needed to do that mitzvah. Lighting Shabbos candles, wax, matches, a table, everything. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful shift. Holiness in everything, always. <gasps> Ooh, that feels overwhelming, but also so powerful because at any given moment, I could make God comfortable here and I could fulfill mitzvot and I could bring light into the world. And you know what? We often look at a mitzvah and there's me and maybe I'll do a mitzvah. Maybe I won't do a mitzvah. I'm struggling with this mitzvah. But Hasidus gives us, Chabad philosophy gives us a whole unique way of looking at a mitzvah. You know, I always ask the students, I say, what's a mitzvah? They say, a good deed. I held a puppy. That's great. That's a mitzvah. But there's more than a good deed. It's not just a car wash. There's more. You know, not just uh, helping someone else wash their car. There's more. A mitzvah is an opportunity to connect God to this world, ourselves, our potential to the oneness of Hashem in a very deep and very powerful way. It's also known as a command, a tzivoy, a command. But an even deeper layer of understanding this is a tzavta, a connection, a bond. At that moment when I am engaging in a mitzvah, I am literally one with Hashem. It's a bond, my soul with God. That is really powerful. And again, it's not just when I'm giving a coin to tzedakah, though that's essential. The altar spends a lot of space and time discussing the power of the mitzvah of tzedakah and how much it accomplishes in this global space on a spiritual plane. Again, very different with the way the world looks at money and materialism. Okay? And when we realize that every mitzvah I do, every battle I wage, every struggle I have, I can serve Hashem, you know what happens? I feel joy. A deep inner joy. Do you remember earlier I was talking about the inner joy that the Altrava lays out that's potential without a trace of sadness? And I remember hearing that when I was younger, I was like, that is like never possible. Yeah, when you know you're here for a reason, your talents, your struggles, your gifts, your abilities, your materialism, your ups, your downs, your good, your bad, it's all part of Hashem. It's all opportunities to serve Hashem. It's all opportunities to bring light into the world. That's pretty powerful. Can I look at my children that way? Can I look at my spouse that way? Yeah, even their struggles are opportunities to serve Hashem. Even their flaws Hashem gave them for a reason. Can I see my mother-in-law that way? 
I happen to. I love my mother-in-law. We get along very well. Public disclaimer. But can I? How much energy am I putting into a different space? So I think that these are really fundamental building blocks that Tanya gives us. There's so much more. And I know we have a little bit more time, correct? Can we go a little further? Or should we open for questions and discussions? I'm going to ask both Itty and Hinzalea because I think you guys are watching. Go ahead. Okay, so first of all, that's, that's a very, it's big. It's really big and it can feel very overwhelming. And it can also feel like it's really um, affects all areas of life. That's the truth. Because toxicity, you know, toxic people have a way of sharing that their toxicity with everyone. Like they don't just keep it to themselves. They're like, oh, I have it. Let me share it with you and you and you and you and you, right? And so how do we, and I think we're always going to meet toxic people. I, I remember once, um, it's happened more than once, but when my child was in camp or in a class with someone who was a bully or toxic, and I would always say to them, you know, I would tell them when they were younger, I say, I should give you an opportunity to learn how to handle annoying people. You'll always meet them right? Like they're always, they're a part of life. They're part of the world. And I think that there's two aspects. Obviously one is trying to create healthy boundaries. And I would really, in this case, probably speak to a mentor or someone that really knew me in my personal circumstance. Cause general advice, when it comes to these things, I can give you some general thoughts, but I think it's, it's usually there's a lot of nuanced details and I can hear from what you're saying. There's a lot of complex layers to this scenario. It doesn't sound like you can just ignore this person forever. Right? So that's what it sounds like. So what I would say is there, are general tool there's general rules of like you know you can't change someone else right you can only change how you react to them that's like a very fundamental you know idea but sometimes you can't get rid of that person because it's you know either not legal or possible <laughs> um it's not happening right you're like okay well you know can't get rid of that person so like how am i going to navigate it i would say try to work on getting gaining tools to empower yourself to live in a healthy, wholesome way and create healthy boundaries between you and that person. And a boundary, here's where women sometimes forget this, a boundary does not mean silent treatment, or as they say in college land, ghosting. That's not a healthy boundary. That's avoidance. And that's sub, you know passive aggressive punishing the person. But I would say I would try to gain skills on how can I maximize my potential I would never use myself, I should say, be cautious not to use self-growth as another um, way to put that person in their place, okay? Because sometimes we, sometimes holiness could be confusing. Like, I, I'm going to go to this class, but it doesn't, I'm going to go learn Torah, but I'm sorry, kids, you have no supper because this is more important, right? My spirituality right now is really, really important. So I would say check in to see, you know, where things are coming from going to, but I really would say, I would really think that there are in general boundaries are important. And sometimes they're just internal boundaries where I can hear what someone says and I don't let it go too far in. Um, I deal with young people all the time. They can say things that can maybe be hurtful. Um, I, but how much am I letting in? Sometimes it's not about what the other person's saying, but it's about the fence that I could put up. And I'm not saying a brick wall, I said a chain link fence, right? Because you could still hear control and understand, but it's under like there's control. So I would try to see what tools I can get to empower myself. And then there is another concept that my, my sons and I, we had a very large discussion slash debate. One of the, call it silver linings, one of the perks of, of quarantine life where my husband and I got to learn together Shabbat mornings. We never had that time. We were always running and doing and and one morning we were learning from the Alter Rebbe a similar, um, a similar kind of um, one of these talks. It wasn't a specific, the, this, the Tanya that we talked about is fundamental principles, right? This was um, one, uh, one of the Alter Rebbe's talks and he was discussing a character flaw, the concept of a character flaw. And he said, often one defines a character flaw as like, that's bad and that's negative and that's a character flaw within ourselves as well. And the term we say is it's a chisaron. It's, it's like a negative. It's like something's, you know, this person's got this flaw. It's got this issue. They're toxic. And al Rabbi says we have to shift the way we define it. Chaser means something is missing. There was an unmet need. When we understand it that way, we say that this is coming from an unmet need. I see it differently. 
And I'll never forget that Shabbat day, me and my boys had a huge, it was a back and forth discussion. One of my sons decided we were defining it wrong. The other one was saying, well, that doesn't mean we were like, it was like a full day, like went into the Shabbat, you know, meal. And then after the Shabbat meal, went to the couches where we were hanging out and playing board games. I remember the younger, the kids, the younger, they were 11. They're like, enough, enough. Like they were done hearing it. But it was such a powerful shift for me that really when we see a flaw in someone, there's something that's unmet. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to be able to meet those needs. But when we can look at it that way, it changes the glasses we have. And maybe that means I ignore when that person says something or I don't let it go so far in or I figure out how to. There are different coping skills. And I would really do that with someone who's a, a professional and who knows my personal circumstances. So I hope that gives some sort of, you know, thoughts on it. And it is a challenge. It's not easy dealing with people who are, have negative energy. Yes, thank so, you. And I wish you lots and lots of luck and joy and empowerment to find the skill set you need to navigate this challenge that Hashem has sent your way. Okay, thank you very much. L'chaim. Itzi, are there any more questions? I know there was one from yesterday and I'm not sure if we've covered it and I forgot. Do you remember it? Can I just, can I just recap that mind blowing thing? Chisaron, like a negative means an unmet need. It's chaser, something's Whoa. missing. Literally, I'm telling you, Itzi, mind blown, shift, <sighs> really. Whoa. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and you know what? Sorry, we see it now. Hand? Oh, there's an unmet need. Psychologists have figured this out. This is going back through. This is our wisdom. This is our Torah. I know. The gift of Torah. The gift of chassidus. And I love how you said it doesn't mean you have to address it or have what it takes to. But just knowing that they, that individual is dealing with an unmet need doesn't make it personal for you anymore. Right. You know, I have to tell you, I think the trick to handling raising teenagers is always depersonalizing because it's not about you. <laughs> it's just not about you. Maybe it's because I'm a thick and in the throes of it right now. Our ego yeah. gets in the way and he's like, it's all about me. They're trying to control me. They're trying to tell me. They're trying to belittle me. It's not about me. It's way bigger. They have their journey, their challenges, their struggle, their way to serve Hashem, their way to bring light into the world. You know, I, I think of you touched on something interesting. I, I think we all have different coping mechanisms. Like everyone's trying, we're just trying to survive, right? Like, and if we can, we even want to thrive. And if we can thrive, like we even want to bring light into it. Like we're just like, I, I feel like my bar and my, my, um, my patience for others has like, I've raised that bar. Cause I'm like, like people are so well-intended and people are really just trying to do it. And maybe for that person, based on their frailty, based on their personality, really they can't handle negative. I know. I'm going to disclaim her. I don't listen to the news. I'm not changing any policies. I'm going to, my job is myself, my family. I'm, I'm not changing, I'm not changing the world, but guess what? And this really comes in, in a very powerful way from, from Tanya, regardless of my internal perfections, I can perfect the world. My starting inward, my little world, I'm not going to change government or policies or my country or my, I'm not even going to, I'm going to be honest with you. I know my place. I'm not going to even affect our electrical grid here in Texas. I'm not, okay, I'll shut my lights a little bit, but I'm not, I'm not creating, but the little changes lead to the big changes. So I would say, I would try to make space for that person and say, I understand that's your way of navigating life. And if that's not comfortable for them, so some people need to surround themselves in a bubble. Um, I think life has a very interesting way of, of waking people up and reminding them the world isn't perfect. So I'm not so worried. It's not like I'm like, oops, they're not going to have reality wake them up. You know, I hear all the time people say to college students, oh, wait till you get into the real world. Wait till you get into the real world. As if they're not dealing with real life. They are. Yeah. Is should I go to the kegger or study a huge uh, dilemma? Probably. I could look and say, okay, come on. You know what I mean? It's not a huge dilemma. But I think we have to understand for each person has their own lens, their own reality, their own way of looking at the world, their own struggles. And maybe for this person, negativity just doesn't work for where they're at. 
I wouldn't fight it and say, well, I'm going to be that negative influence and remind you the world isn't perfect. The world has plenty of ways to remind them, plenty of ways to knock at the door and say, here's a challenge, here's a challenge. So I, I just feel like, especially now, we're, there's a certain level of fragility coming on a year of this pandemic. There's a certain level of fragility that I would be, I wouldn't be the one to like, I'm going to burst your bubble and make sure you know that Pollyanna is not a thing. I, personally, I know. If you feel like it's detrimental and it's preventing them from like surviving, thriving, putting food on the table, protecting themselves, that's a whole different conversation. But as if they just don't enjoy a conversation about reality, okay, find other people to talk to. That's my very humble, non-professional opinion. Just be sensitive. I think there's something so powerful. Always be something I have learned from, you know, there's a story I heard as a young girl that one of the Chabad Rebbe's, he used to meet one-on-one -on -one with people, Yechidas, meeting of the mind, the soul, to really, to really connect with them. And one day he asked his, his assistant, his shamish, to give him like a new shirt. And, and it, what happened? He was literally drenched from, from the meetings, the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Okay. And his shamish said, why? Like, why do you need to change? And he said, you don't understand when I'm meeting with someone, I sit down and I hear what they're telling me. And then I have to change into their mindset. Then I have to change back into a Rebbe's mindset, a leader's mindset, a mentor's mindset to give them advice. Then I have to change back into the mindset of them, change back into their clothing to hear how they processed it. And then all this back and forth, it's physically, you know, it's exhausting. And it's, I remember when I was younger, I literally envisioned the Rebbe having a hook with a bunch of different coats because he was changing clothing. I, okay, I was five, six when I heard the story. But what it's taught me such a deep lesson of life. When I sit with a, stu a student who comes in to tell me that their dog may be diagnosed with cancer and like we're in the middle of a pandemic, like it takes a lot of like, where are they holding and what's going on and how this dog means, what this dog means. So it takes a lot of me really, you know, trying to understand what they're feeling, what they're experiencing. And I think this circles back to our first conversation that we had in the beginning. Yeah. is when that lady said, what makes you Chabadniks Chabadniks? How do you do it? How do you have students who come in with all sorts of baggage, layers, complexities, maybe not the finest, uh, most fine-tuned behavior? How do you, and it comes back, and I will end with this point from the, from the Alta Rebbe, from Tanya. There's a parak called Parak Lamed Beis. Do you remember I touched upon the idea that we are souls that happen to be in bodies, we're godly, we're divine? The Alta Rebbe says, if that is true for you, your friend, your neighbor, your sibling, even your sibling, <laughs> even your spouse, they're one. You're Achim Mamish. You're literally part of one source, one holiness, one God. And so if we can try to see ourselves in a holy spiritual way, and I happen to have flaws and bumps and bruises and issues and challenges and struggles, can I get myself to see my fellow that way? Can I see it through their lens? Can I see this oneness? They're also a conduit for godliness. And it requires sensitivity. And it requires molding, stretching, shaping. Uh, it's not simple. I don't think anyone thinks so. But Hashem obviously put that person in your life for a reason. And I trust he has given you the capacity and the ability to see beyond the annoyance and see the inner soul and really go beyond the, the superficial layer. Thank you.